So uh, welcome everyone. It's really lovely to see your faces. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to doing this course. It's, um, it's just going to be three sessions um, done and dusted of a text that really you could use your whole life. It's a beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful text. Um, so if you oh, refuge in Bodhicitta. Sangge chudon sogi chunam lai janju padu dane gapsuchi dagi chun yen gi pe sonam gi kola penje sangge drupa sho sangge chudon sogi chunam la janju padu dane gapsuchi Dagi chun yen gi pe sonam ki Krola penje sangge drupa sho sangge Chudon so gi chunam la Jan chul padu dane gap suchi Dagi chun yen gi pe sonam ki Krola penje sangge drupa sho And just letting the motivation connect So if you haven't ever kind of registered um, this text before, it's called Mind Training Like the Rays of the Sun by Nam Kapel. And, um, and there's a, this publication that I'm using is um, from the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives, but you can get it electronically as well. So if you don't wanna get a hard copy and wait for ages for shipping, it's available electronically. And um, on Alexander Burzin's website, Study Buddhism, there's a commentary by His Holiness, and then there's a commentary by Dr. Burzin as well. So if you're wanting any follow-up, um, I really recommend Study Buddhism. It's a great website, and it has really accurate information. So just, you know, laying that out there right before we start. Um, I know that um, it's too short a time to go through the whole text. So what I'm going to do is highlight, like, my kind of most... I guess for lack of a better word, favorite parts that really move my mind during hardships. So the significance of this text is that it's using the mind training tradition and the Lam Rim tradition together. And for those of you familiar with Tibetan Buddhism, you know that those are our two main structures. You know, basically the stages of the path and thought transformation. Lam Rim, Lo Zhang. Those, those Tibetan words you hear thrown around a lot, and this text uses them both. So um, it's a really excellent way of framing your mind to cope with hardship, and even more than cope with hardship, to embrace hardship, and to use it as a way to open your heart further and further, and have a happier and happier life because of it. So it's in that grand tradition of mind training that lots of you have studied, Wheel of Sharp Weapons, Eight Verses of Thought Transformation, all those kind of texts that you know and love. It's of that kind of genre. And it's structured in alignment with the Lam Rim. So um, this first session is gonna be the like chatty explaining session. And then um, the other two sessions are gonna be more meditation, discussion, and drilling down into the specifics of the text. But um, I think it's important to know the context. So I'm just gonna do a really short context overview, just so you kind of know where we are and you're oriented to the text, and then we'll dive in. Okay, so I have a very short PowerPoint, but it's not gonna be too long, I promise. And hopefully it will um, get everybody oriented and um, understand where we are. And also, I am a nerd and I like PowerPoints. So that's what's happened. <laughs> Bear with me. And you can ask questions after. Okay. <clears throat> so um, this text that we're using is by Nam Kapel. And it's a commentary to Geshe Chekawa's Seven Point Mind Training. So I think it's useful to know the sutra sources for things. Um, some people are interested in that and some people aren't. But um, just to know that whenever we're looking at a Dharma teaching, where, where did the Buddha talk about it? Because there's these commentaries upon commentaries upon commentaries. Where did the Buddha talk about it? So um, there are two sutra sources of this text. Um, one is the Gandavoya Sutra, which is part of a much longer text called the Avatamsaka Sutra. And it's about a young pilgrim seeking enlightenment. 
He goes to 50 different bodhisattvas and each of them teaches a different type of bodhisattva practice. This text and the larger one are among the few texts that were translated into Tibetan from Chinese, primarily because the original Sanskrit had been lost by the time it was transmitted to Tibet. So some Kappa said that if this weren't for the literature, Tibet wouldn't really have the full teachings of the Bodhisattva path. So it's another one of those grand ironies that um, <clears throat> Tibetan um, Buddhism really did rely on Chinese Buddhism in a lot of the time when it was moving into Tibet. And uh, now of course that is less the case. So then the second sutra is a complicated Sanskrit name, which I will not attempt. <laughs> um, and you can read it there. It, uh, many people question the sutra sources of these mind training teachings. So Serkong Rinpoche, one of the great Rinpoches in our tradition, explained. Um, they were also quite extensively explained by Shantideva in engaging in bodhisattva behavior or guide to a bodhisattva's way of life. So their sutra, their sutra representation of the mind training tradition is the main thing to understand here. This isn't just some uh, kind of Tibetan upgrade on the Dharma or just some like version of it that they came up with. This has really scriptural sources way back from the Buddha. Why is that important? Well, if you're looking at a teaching that's coming from an ordinary mind, you're probably going to get an ordinary result. If you're looking at a teaching from an enlightened mind, you're going to get an enlightened result. So I think that it's important whenever you're coming across any kind of transformative work to ask who was the source. Of course, you know, there is no copyright on wisdom, but the person who initially explained the teaching, I think that it's uh, useful to make sure it's someone who actually had realizations because otherwise it's a, it's a bit of a difficult path. So everything kind of boils down to Lama Atisha for us in Tibetan Buddhism kind of the source of everything amazing and wonderful <laughs> came from Lama Atisha. And uh, he was the great trailblazer of the Lama Rim tradition. So Lama Atisha was a Nalanda master in India, that huge, amazing institution that existed for so many years um, that had thousands of monk practitioners roll through it um, until it was destroyed. And Lama Atisha traveled from India to Tibet. He was requested to come and help clarify Buddhism for Tibetans. And he actually composed the lamp on the path to enlightenment in Tibet. And um, so, you know, in Nalanda Monastery and in India, they were kind of, you know, like missing him and wishing he was there, but they thought it was kind of worth the trip because based on his amazing trip to Tibet, he wound up composing this text that we use today. And this is the text from which the Lamrim teachings of Lama Tsongkhapa, et cetera, derive from, and that Lama Tsongkhapa expounded upon. So this lamp on the path to enlightenment or lamp to the path to enlightenment, this text is one of our most significant texts because it's really where the Lamrim was framed. So when you hear Lamrim, think stages of the path or think sequential, linear, taking all of the Buddha's teachings and putting them into step by step, remembering that during the Buddha's lifetime, he didn't teach in a linear way. He taught in a way that was directly to the people in front of him. Some of the people in front of him were beginners. Some of the people in front of him were very advanced. And so within the Buddha's lifetime and his 40 years after his enlightenment in particular, um, it was all over the place in terms of what came first, what came second, because he was just teaching to who was in front of him. So it was a huge deal that Lama Ticha took all of the Buddhist teachings and then kind of summarized and organized them and put them into this framework that makes them really accessible for us. So he's the Lamrim tradition founder, but then he's also the Lojong tradition holder. For us, um, Atisha received this lineage from Lama Sirlingpa. He had made this like arduous journey to Sumatra in order to receive from him, probably because he heard about these like thought transformation teachings from Dharma Rakshita, who wrote Wheel of Sharp Weapons. Atisha then brought them to Tibet, transmitting them along with his Kadam tradition that followed. Um, the teaching is then went to Atisha's main disciple, Dom Trumpa, from him to Geshe Patoa, who had disciples like uh, Geshe Langratampa, who wrote eight verses of thought transformation. 
So Lama Atisha held thought transformation and stages of the past teachings, um, propagated them, proliferated them. And then they kind of divided into people who were good at one and people who were good at the other. And they, they kind of didn't come back together, unified as often as they could have. It was like people kind of chose a major like in university or they chose an emphasis and um, they didn't necessarily bring the two traditions together in an obvious explicit way in the same way that Lama Atisha did until you get to people like Lama Tsongkhapa. So Geshe Chakawa is who actually wrote Seven Point Mind Training. Um, he, you know, he was one of these uh, great Kadampa masters and, um, and you can, you know, read about him as much as you'd like to. Basically know that uh, he was a Lojong master and um, he was uh, related to these mind training traditions. So, um, you know, the older disciple of Geshe Patawa, Langri Tampa, wrote the eight verses. And he, and then this Geshe Chekawa never actually met Geshe Langri Tampa, but he received the teachings from his disciple, Geshe Sharawa. So Geshe Sharawa, or Geshe Chekawa, excuse me, was so inspired by the eight verses and this mind training tradition in general that he composed the seven point mind training. So I know it's a lot of Geshe's and times and you know, who are all these people? Um, you know, you can make yourself a little timeline and these aren't even all the players in the whole scene. You know, this is just kind of the main people involved. But to know that this was an unbroken oral tradition from the time of the Buddha until now, then it has this lineage of blessings and this lineage of realizations and this transmission ability all the way to us in this present day. And I think that makes it more accessible as well as more powerful. So then you got your classic Lama Tsongkhapa. Um, and Lama Tsongkhapa really kind of came into prominence around the 14th century. So a ways down the track from Lama Atisha and some of these other Kadampa masters. And Lama Tsongkhapa, you know, he traveled incredibly extensively. And he was practicing and gathering and practicing and gathering. And basically he put the Dharma back together. The Dharma had gotten kind of dispersed and had gone all over the world, or not all over the world, but all over Asia and these different parts, but not in its complete form. And it also had gotten mixed with some of the local religions and local traditions. Um, some of it had gotten watered down, some of it had gotten into a mistaken way, which is just a natural thing to happen as information travels, as we know today. So Lama Tsongkhapa was amazing that he basically gathered all the pieces back together and then he composed this amazing text, the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, the Lam Rim Chenmo, among many other profound texts. And um, he's the most significant figure in our tradition, the Gelug tradition. And Nam Kapel is one of his disciples. Nam Kapel composed this book that we're looking at today, Mind Training Like the Rays of the Sun, which combines Lam Rim with Lo Zhang using seven point mind training as a basis. So that's where we arrive at, is uh, the text that we're looking at is from a disciple of Lama Tsongkhapa, which means it contains thought transformation and stages of the path teachings together, which is why it's quite profound. So, when we're looking at this text, basically, you're just kind of remembering the Lam Rim structure in brief boils down to like three scopes, doesn't it? Yeah, so remembering that there's the initial scope, the medium scope, and the great scope related to like the range or the depth of one's motivation or ability. Yeah, so you can approach the three scopes from the framework of what you're able to do or from the perspective of what you want to do or both. So when we look at the initial scope, I'm going to stop the share. Do you guys remember kind of what the goal or the motivation of like a small scope practitioner is or a initial scope being? What's their main goal? Do you remember? A good next rebirth. Yeah, a good next rebirth. Um, sometimes even less than that. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. 
And then the, the medium scope practitioner, what are they aiming for? Uh, enlightenment. Wait, no? Nirvana. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. So we're first aiming for a good rebirth. Um, and good rebirth in terms of what depends on the small, small scope practitioner, but hopefully a good rebirth that continues their spiritual path. Medium scope practitioner is aiming for nirvana. Then great scope practitioner is aiming for what? Then it's easy, right? What is great scope practitioner aiming? For the benefit of all sentient beings. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, complete enlightenment. So then what's the difference between uh, mere nirvana and full enlightenment? Um, enlightenment is for the benefit of all sentient beings and nirvana is not necessarily that. Um, yep. Yeah, that's one way of framing it. Yep, for yeah. sure. Yeah, Would what else? Would it do Say again, know? Paul, it broke up. Bodhicitta. Bodhicitta. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yep. We all suffer, all the suffering of all sentient beings. Yep. What can Buddhas do that beings abiding in nirvana can't do? It, 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 it's uh, going up spontaneously when it's enlightenment. This is the difference. It is one of the differences, yeah. There's a spontaneity in their enlightened activity. Absolutely. Um, you know, they can just do things automatically. Um, there's, there's a word I'm looking for, which is a really important word to understand in terms of the difference between nirvana and enlightenment. And it's how the Buddha is able to benefit sentient beings in a complete and direct way. What is that like ingredient that they really need in order to benefit beings in a complete way? Is it omniscience? Yeah, omniscience, exactly. Exactly, it's omniscience. And this all-knowing ability means that things are no longer an educated guess. So, you know, beings who are abiding in nirvana might actually be very kind people, very, very altruistic people in the sense of non-harmfulness and maybe even wanting to help. There's less of a personal responsibility. Um, but the main thing that prevents them from being of benefit to sentient beings is they don't see every nuance. They don't see as far as the future is able to be seen. They don't see um, relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously. And that means that their ability to benefit might still have mistakes. And a Buddha knows for this person, they have too many karmic obscurations to move in this direction, but I can move them in this direction by offering these conditions. You know, they know very specifically and precisely. So omniscience is something that we really need in order to benefit sentient beings. And um, that's the big difference between someone abiding in nirvana and someone who's achieved full enlightenment. So the three scopes, basically, you know, there are three goals. You know, they're, they're the goal of a good human rebirth or a high realm rebirth or a pure land rebirth or a goal. And then the middling scope, a goal to get out of samsara or to achieve nirvana. Then the great scope being is wanting to achieve full enlightenment Buddhahood. It's three different goals, but for us, it's like we might have the great scope goal, but the small scope ability. Yeah, which is completely fine and is a, a vital self-knowing. It's a vital self-knowing because if you think of yourself as a great scope practitioner, and you identify as a Mahayanist, but actually the activities of your day are full of, you know, self-centeredness, full of hypocrisy, um, you know, <laughs> full of um, all sorts of things that go against your path. There, there can be this spiritual bypassing that, that you hear me talk about a lot where you're jumping over what's actually happening and going to what you think should be the case. Yeah, so like, for example, now with the virus, you could think, um, oh, this virus is a wonderful opportunity. I can spend more time with my family. I can spend more time with my practice. I can simplify my life. I can, ha I can manage my finances differently and we'll get through this together. It's an opportunity to unify. And all of that is true. And 
it can't be true unless you first acknowledge how hard it is. Yeah, and so, so what we do is we know what should be the case for our mind training ability. And in knowing what should be the case, trying to jump there, we ignore what is, and we're not able to kind of travel the path as deeply or with as much compassion for others because we're a little bit not wanting to see our actual state of affairs. So what we want is a great scope motivation while knowing what scope we actually live in. And the scope we actually live in might not even be the small scope. It might be in the preliminaries. We might just be trying to have a good life, a meaningful life, not, never mind future lives. And it's okay to want to have just a meaningful life and aim towards enlightenment, but um, to not kind of fully yourself into thinking you're a more advanced practitioner than you really are. Um, because that kind of inflated spiritual pride will lead to disillusionment. Yeah, because after a while, you'll start to feel like the Dharma doesn't work because you've actually been pushing past your current abilities. You know, you've been trying to run a marathon before you could walk around the block. And then you hurt yourself and you're grumpy and you think this is stupid and it doesn't work when in fact you hadn't paced yourself in a way that was reasonable for you. And the backlash is then thinking there's something wrong with you or something wrong with the Dharma when neither was the case. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with the Dharma. Everything is pacing. Transformation is always possible. So in looking at the three scopes, we know what should be the case and then we have to acknowledge what actually is the case. And that's why when we move into the mind training tradition, and the, or sometimes called the thought transformation tradition, it's so useful to hold the long rim framework. Because remember that thought, that thought transformation work is very much Mahayana. It's very much a great scope practitioner. It's for advanced practitioners. And we love mind training and we're really inspired by it, but we can only actually do it on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> when we're really focused and grounded and well motivated and feeling held by our practice on those days we can do the mind training the rest of the time instead of thinking of it as a deficiency that you can't think of it as an aspiration and something that you're looking forward to being able to do so you're looking forward to being able to think in this way some of the ways in this text that it encourages you to think are radical you know, the, um, the very last point in seven point mind training, there's lots of mini points within them. The last one is don't expect applause, <laughs> right? Or don't expect gratitude. And like, we can all be like, yeah, that would be a great way to live. Wouldn't that be a great way to live to never expect people to be grateful, to never expect to be validated or applauded. And we all think, yeah, that's a great way to live. But when we do something good, we kind of want someone to like pat us on the head and say, that was good, you know, you know, if we're honest, right? So it's, it's acknowledging what we want to be the case while seeing what is and trying to let the mind training tradition really give us that really light humor of self-awareness. You know, where you just laugh at your own inconsistencies and you see how absurd the afflictions are because the afflictions are always saying, I'm helping you protect yourself. I'm helping you get happy. And that has always been nonsense. But when you're buying into them, it feels true. And then you see the mind training tradition and you get embarrassed because you identify with your afflictions as you. So if you can start to see afflictions as just habit energy that lives here, then it's easier to say, no, get rid of those. Yeah, it doesn't feel like an act of self-harm. So from the two perspectives of what I'd like to be the case and where I actually am, and that dissonance doesn't have to be a problem. Actually recognizing the dissonance is vital to moving through the stages. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so please, you know, when you find some of these like mind training slogans too radical for your daily life, 
try to at least see the aspirational quality of how wonderful it would be to live in this way. How wonderful it would be if everyone lived in this way. How much richer and happier life would be if we all connected with things in this way. Okay, so those are the three scopes. Do you have questions about the, the LOMRIM frameworks? A lot of you are quite familiar, but some of you aren't. Um, is it clear so far? Okay, so mind training like the rays of the sun um, has this framework as its basis. And then um, it goes into the seven point mind training of Geshe Chikawa, which is great scope but um great scope with fine print because the very first one is explaining the preliminaries the basis of practice so explaining the preliminaries is basically the small scope well actually the preliminaries and the small scope and the medium scope so your precious human rebirth you're learning how to meditate you're finding a teacher all of that kind of preliminary work is in point number one um, understanding the meditation session, just kind of getting the basic distractions under control, all of that is under point number one. So kind of getting under, getting a, a handle of point number one, you're doing really amazing in your practice, never mind the rest of them. So um, that's kind of where we're going, but basically the second one is the main practice training in bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment then transforming adverse circumstances into the path, or basically transforming difficulty into richness, or transforming hardship into strength. And number four is the integrated practice of one life. So basically how to live each day, each session, each life in this really um, kind of tidy and organized way that helps you gather momentum and continuity and it's related very much to the five powers then we have the commitments of mind training and the guidelines of mind training and number six and seven have a lot of bullet points under them which are just really short pithy slogans to kind of like drill into your head so that they pop up during your daily life and keep you from taking yourself too seriously because the nature of afflictions really, I mean, is to make the mind unpeaceful. But a symptom is when you start taking yourself too seriously. Yeah, the, the afflictions are very sure of their importance. That's how it can be very clear that that's what's driving you instead of bodhicitta. Do you know that feeling of like when you're angry and you're serious about it? Or you're attached and you're serious about it? and you have your pride and you're very serious about it. Do you know that feeling where it, like, it feels really um, personal, it feels very you, it feels very important, and if someone were to tease you, you would be aggravated. You wouldn't laugh at yourself and say, yeah, you're right, I'm being silly. You would say, you don't understand how important this is to me. That's the sign that the affliction is driving. Yeah, so there can be the affliction present, but it not be driving so much when you're, you know, you're a bit irritable, you're a bit grumpy, and someone says to you, you seem irritable and grumpy, and you check and you go, oh, yeah, I am. Oh, sorry. And you laugh it off. That's how you know the affliction isn't driving too badly. If someone says you look irritable and grumpy and you say, no, I'm not, <laughs> or yes, I am, and here is why. All right, that's the sign that we've got some uh, work to do because it got stuck in there and now it is in control. Do you feel the two ways that it like lives in your mind? There's like living lightly in your mind, but like able to dispel and disperse and dissolve. And then there's the version where it is really anchored in and you have to almost let it roll through and sober up because it's really decided that it's in charge and it's very important. <laughs> right? So um, that's the that's the little thing we're looking for is when the emotion feels very important, that usually means it's completely nonsense. Yeah, it doesn't mean the reasons are completely nonsense. See, this is where it gets tricky. Your reasons for being angry or sad or irritable, they might be actually very valid reasons to 
label as not what I wanted or not what is good or not what is useful. But if you can see that that can be true without the emotional response and actually without the giant emotional response, you're better able to deal with the issue. Then emotions start looking like information rather than truth. Do you kind of feel the distinction? Right, so it's not like you're ignoring emotions or saying they don't matter. They're just not mattering in the same way as we've been trained to think. They're information, you know, we don't want to pretend not to have them. You know, it's, uh, remember the 12 links, how feeling is depicted as the arrow in the eye? Like, we're not going to be able to ignore it. But um, to kind of change the branding or the heading that we put on emotions, this is the key thing. So I don't want to do too many um, long sessions because it can get a bit heady. Um, so I thought we'd just have like little breaks peppered throughout. Um, are you ready for a break now or do you want to go for another 15 minutes? Still feel fresh? Fresh enough? Okay, we'll keep going. Um, but uh, start waving at me if you're drowning. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So we're going to go into the actual, um, the actual mind training verses, and we're going to start with number one, um, explaining the preliminaries, the basis for spiritual practice. So I'll do share screen, but um, these handouts you guys all have um, emailed to you as well. So we're looking at the study notes. And uh, let's see, does everybody see those okay on the share screen? Yep. Okay. So this commentary that I'm going to give you, this is based on um, mind training like the rays of the sun, as well as the oral commentary that I've received from Geshe Jamyang um, at Chen Rezig Institute, who taught this text to us um, once a week for like two years. It was just kind of his weekly public talk text that he went over for ages. And then, um, then my root guru, Kensu Rinpoche Geshe Chasish Sering, has um, taught this many times as well. So some of this is directly findable in mind training like the rays of the sun. And some of it is um, added stuff from the oral tradition that I've got from my teachers. Um, if you're looking for a really colloquial, really accessible version of mind training, we have um, The Places That Scare You by Pema Children is related to this text. So The Places That Scare You, that's um, the old classic many of you have read, but it's actually talking about the same text just in a gentler way. Okay, so first, training in the preliminaries. Two ways, either preliminaries to bodhicitta or preliminaries to the meditation session. There's two schools of thought on what it's referring to, and both are really valid. In this text, we're looking at it as preliminaries to bodhicitta. So before you have the mind of enlightenment, before you can genuinely want to be enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, um, you know, there needs to be a real self-assessment that suffering exists and it's unacceptable. Yeah. Suffering exists and it's unacceptable. Suffering exists and it has a cause. Suffering's cause is not my friends, family, coworkers, or environment, <laughs> right? That's a key thing, right? The reason I'm suffering is not because of what's going on. Because what's going on sometimes is a condition for suffering and sometimes isn't, right? So, having this initial small scope goal to achieve higher rebirth to continue the path is really important before you have bodhicitta genuinely. So relying on a qualified Mahayana spiritual teacher comes first in the Lam Rim, but for Westerners or for modern folks who didn't grow up Buddhist, this can come later. Yeah, um, it's, it's like you need a guide in order to go somewhere you've never been, but it might be that you read Lonely Planet and look at some maps and Google some stuff for a long time before you set up on the trip, and that inspires you and gets you ready to go on the journey, and then you're eventually ready to get a guide. So the guide is vital, but it's not like you can't practice for a while without a guide. You are practicing without a teacher. It's just um, eventually you're going to need a real one. So the first thing really is to look at the perfect human rebirth. So 
when you guys look at perfect human rebirth, you know about the eight freedoms and the 10 richnesses and these kind of lists that we go over all the time. And that the basis is that a human being is a perfect life for spiritual practice. That's why we want to be a human being. Why is a human life perfect for spiritual practice? Because of the possibility to transform our minds. We have a mind, you know, that we can change, we can work with. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, it's also good to be reborn in a pure land, but for us, uh, human rebirth is important. Why? And Nizan, did you have something? We have like enough suffering, but not too much, so we can understand some samsara. And we can understand we live in a toilet and not try to decorate the toilet and want to get out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's that, it's that perfect combination of we have enough suffering and enough happiness. So it's not just being a human being, is it? Because some human lives don't have enough happiness to practice on the path. And some human lives have too much happiness and they're drunk with happiness and they just are kind of in their orb of delight, right? Um, so what we want is a perfect human life, not meaning you're a perfect person, but that you've, you've struggled, you know? You've had some struggles, inner struggles, outer struggles. You've seen some things, you've had some trauma or seen some trauma. Um, you had it rough, but not so rough that it broke you, yeah? Or maybe it broke you a little bit and you patched yourself up and now you're ready for the path. You know, that actually having had some hardship in your background is pretty vital for a perfect human rebirth. Um, later down the path, you might not need to get your heart broken again and again in order to think a spiritual path is a good idea. Um, may that come soon. <laughs> may all of our future rebirths be without heartache. Um, and for us still to have very strong bodhicitta and want to work for the welfare of others. But at our level, we need a shock. Yeah, we need to be disappointed. We need to be betrayed. We need to be hurt. We need these things, but not so many of these things that we don't believe in happiness and joy and connection and love. So a perfect human life for a spiritual path has had enough of both, enough sadness and enough happiness. Enough sadness to think, I don't want anyone to ever feel like this. I don't want to feel like this. Where does this come from? I have questions. You know, enough like sadness to make you a seeker. And then the happiness is enough that you have, you know, financial resources, uh, physical resources, societal resources, different supports where if you wanted to follow a spiritual path, all of the opportunities are there. So if we look at our lives, I think we all have a perfect human rebirth. Yeah, I'm guessing. We all have a perfect human rebirth and, you know, we're not getting any younger and the brain and the mind are not the same thing, but the mind uses the brain. And in order for us to progress on the path, we need to use this brain. And as it gets older, it can be harder to work with and it can get more set in its ways if we let it. You know, you see all the amazing scientific proof about how the brain can stay transformable and elastic all the way through old age. But, you know, the fine print is, only if you invite that transformation, only if you try, only if you want to, you know. So the question is, do we feel lucky? Do we feel grateful? Do we feel like we have a perfect human rebirth? You know, because if you really feel it, then very naturally the drive to use it comes. But if you don't feel it, it's easy to kind of excuse yourself to do all sorts of kind of frivolous, superficial forms of chasing happiness. That makes perfect sense if you don't really think of the value of your own life. Yeah, so really sitting with, I am one of the very, very fortunate few who has met a spiritual path and has time and resources to pursue it. You know, this is really significant. There are so few human beings compared to ants. 
<laughs> you know, there are so few human beings who have health and resources and safety. And safety is relative, of course, but we have enough safety to do our path. And this is huge. So, you know, the problem is, is that you can sit with your perfect human rebirth contemplations and then come to the conclusion that you're very, very bad for not using it. Yeah, that you think, oh, I do have everything, I do have everything, and yet still I do this nonsense, and I really want to go to this concert, and I really want to read this novel that I've read five times already, and I know I have a perfect human rebirth, but please let me do my samsara. I love my samsara. Don't take it from me. It's all I have, right? And then you feel like you're a terrible, terrible person for not using your perfect human rebirth. Right, so it can go either way. You can feel like I have nothing, I can do nothing, therefore I'm going to collapse in a heap of, I don't know, disillusionment and apathy and indulgence. Or um, I know I should be better than this, but if I just don't remember my perfect human rebirth, then I'm allowed to not ever change. Yeah, if I remember my perfect human rebirth, then I just feel flooded with guilt and shame and regret. So neither of those are useful. We know that. But what is the way to sit with, yes, I do need to step up my discipline without feeling like you're whipping yourself or forcing yourself or giving yourself rules and structures that you're then going to rebel against. You know, there's just this power of remembering that everything is voluntary. You know, we chose to do this path because it makes us really happy to have deeper meaning in our life. That makes us happy. Yeah. And so when we're looking at perfect human rebirth, just make sure that you're falling in the center of the teachings rather than into your own superstitions and diversions of what you're telling yourself about the teachings. Either I'm very, very bad, or I'm very, very good, or I can't look at this, or I have to look at that, or all of this kind of should and back and forth and anxiety and stress about the teaching. Just see it raw and let it touch you to the degree it's able to touch you based on your receptivity. You know, not force feeding, not avoiding, just kind of like hold it in front of you and see if it can kind of bleed in. You know, like standing in the sunshine and letting the rays touch you and getting slowly warmed up by them. You know, sometimes you might be so warm that it's overwhelming and you need a bit of shade and you need to go, I don't know, skiing in the Alps or something, but you're doing it with the mentality of, then I'm going to go back to my practice. I just need a little break. I needed a refresh. It was getting a bit too intense, but that doesn't mean I don't love it or I'm not, it doesn't mean that I'm bad for needing to pace myself. Yeah. So the key to all of this is just to know what you're doing while you're doing it. It's a bit like meditation where you can start to think that if you're doing a mindfulness meditation on the breath, that the point is to stay on the breath. When in fact, the point is to watch your mental attitude about your focus, you know? And the breath happens to be the reference or the object, but it could be an image of the Buddha or it could be an analysis or it could be a sadhana or it could be this or it could be that. And the point is not the thing you're looking at. The point is the attitude and, and awareness you're bringing to that. But anything could be the reference, yeah. So, um, so perfect human rebirth is so easy intellectually, but so hard experientially to use in a way that doesn't trigger guilt, shame, defensiveness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but just kind of be with, we are the lucky ones and um, let that touch you. And then remember right on the back of perfect human rebirth is to remember impermanence. So I have everything I need and death is coming. <laughs> Yeah, so I have everything I need and it's going to change, you know, something to trigger an urgency that is not an anxiety. Yeah, just kind of a trying to stop expecting stability. Um, stop expecting that you're going to get everything together and that it'll just be lovely and organized all the way to your death and you'll die quietly in your sleep at 108 surrounded by your loving friends and family who all will wish you well and be grateful that you existed you know death is not usually that tidy 
And um, so this perfect human rebirth could change at any time. And we want continuity with our practice to not forget everything we learned this life. Yeah. So I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, for me, thinking of how much work I've done in this life to train my mind, and then thinking that a lot of that will be forgotten in my next life, if I don't sink it in, that is frustrating. Yeah, and that can be a little bit like demoralizing if I let it, or it can be empowering of, I really need to drill these things in because I don't wanna lose all of this work I did. So if I'm looking at a day, what is the per percentage of my day spent reinforcing habits that I value? And what is the percentage of the day reinforcing habits I really don't want to take with me? You know, then, you know, then the content hopefully will come as well, but just to really sit with in terms of percentages of helpful habits, because when we really like take a day and check, it could be that like 80% of the day is habits we can really do without. Not the activities, not like eating and sleeping and whatever, you still need eating and sleeping, but the attitude you're bringing to like eating and sleeping. You know, it could be that every time you eat, you decide it's a, <laughs> Karen's saying 90%. Um, it, it could be that every time you eat, that's like your permission to like switch off and go into like an attachment indulgence. Or that every time you sleep, you're like, now I am done for the day. I'm going to stop being mindful. I'm going to stop caring about other people. This is my sleepy time. Everybody better go away. This is my sleepy time. And, you know, there's nothing in the Dharma saying you're not allowed to sleep. You're allowed to sleep. In fact, you should sleep regularly and well and deeply so that you're refreshed to be of benefit to sentient beings. But if your attitude towards something like sleep, which is so many hours of a day, is this is for me, then <laughs> that's many hours of cultivating that habit. If you go to sleep thinking, I dedicate the merit of the day, may the next day continue to be of meaning, and may this sleep help rejuvenate this body so that I can continue to be a vessel to be of benefit to sentient beings. Some sort of altruism right before your head hits the pillow, even if it's just omani pemi hum, then you actually might have quite a virtuous sleep and you might even have lovely dharma dreams or at least go into kind of a neutral that's not causing too much trouble. You know, it's not about changing the details and the content of your life. It's about changing the attitude you bring to them. And it could be that we have a nice little morning meditation and a nice little evening meditation, which is amazing. But if we're not pulling the energy from the morning meditation to the evening meditation and into sleep, then there's so many hours of reinforcing afflictions. You know, so it's like, okay, getting in the car, is that my excuse to switch off my altruism and start being selfish? Or is that, you know, a moment of clicking back into all right, I'm better, I'm about to enter into a fray of many stressful people who are very anxious about getting here and getting there and getting to their parking place first and getting in front of me first and me first, me first. I'm about to enter into that. May I not contribute to that energy? May I actually be a little bubble of peace on the road that might radiate out? You know, so just just kind of keeping that in the back of the mind of here's this perfect human rebirth, which is amazing, and death is coming. If I have a whole different life with whole different details and parents and situation, what is the thing in my habits that's going to kind of translate into new activities, but it's just going to be my constant way of thinking? Are all of those things useful? What's the narrative in the back of my mind? Is it what about me? What about me? <laughs> or when can I take a break? When can I take a break? Or is it, may I be a benefit to all sentient beings, for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings? You know, <clears throat> and so just kind of gently changing the percentages, again, with that really mindful pacing that's not pushing yourself too quickly, but is also not holding back thinking, oh, I'll sort it out someday when I have time. Because you'll never have that kind of time. 
And even if you magically did wind up with one of those amazing retirements where you had nothing but time and everything with uh, perfect money and resources, what usually happens is then you just enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't necessarily decide to take that opportunity to be the great yogi that you always intended to be once you retired. You know, you just like, let's go see every beautiful European country and see all the architecture. And now let's go to all of the beautiful forests of the world. And let's just see all those things, even though there's beautiful architecture and beautiful forests right here, wherever we are in whatever country we're in, there's something cool we could go look at if we needed a break and then go back to our practice. Still, there's this hunger for stimulation and this fear of being unstimulated, which um, kind of robs us of our perfect human rebirth. So, you know, don't wait for things to come together. Don't wait to have time. You know, just build it into what you're already doing. Okay, just gently, gently, okay? <clears throat> and, so then the middle scope, um, as we talked about before, the goal is to get out of the prison of cyclic existence to achieve nirvana. And in order to have the drive or the will to do this, um, it helps to remember karma. Yeah, so this is following on with that idea of habits, habits and their results. And when we're looking at our habits, you know, it can get kind of, I don't know, poignant or confronting and a little bit like, oh, jais, oh, uh, I have a lot I need to work on and yet it's so hard to change a habit. That very awareness can lead you to what you need, which is refuge. So rather than kind of having that self-awareness strike you in the wrong way of just, oh my gosh, so much work to do and so little willpower to do it, <laughs> actually make it go, oh, right, so little willpower to do it. I need some backup. I really need some backup, you guys. Okay, refuge, refuge, refuge. Okay, I'm a baby, so I need outer refuge first and I need to really work on it and build it. And then I need to bring that into an inner refuge that's no longer reliant on the outside. But at first I need some outer support. So Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha outside, then gradually Buddha, Dharma, Sangha inside. So I need, you know, I need some outside teachers. I need to go to class. I need to have things live and in person. I need that and that's good that I know that, you know, rather than seeing, oh, I'm so full of bad habits and I'm creating all this bad karma and oh no, oh, no, just go, yeah, right, that's the case. So I better go to class. <laughs> you know? And then the Dharma, you know, you read your books, just gently, gently, just read them. You know, you don't have to read your books like a novel, you know, mind training like the rays of the sun, right? It's just little, but you know, you don't have to sit down and read it cover to cover, just like pick one part, read one paragraph, put it down and then think about it. You know, or write yourself one line about what was clear or what was confusing. Just really gentle. And then go for a walk and have a sandwich and pet a dog and, you know, whatever. But it's just kind of like remembering that to have refuge, you need to cultivate that relationship. Because even outer refuge isn't really outer. We're not a religion that says, you know, God, please save me right? We're, we're a religion that says, you who have come before me, I could use some support to do the same thing. Yeah, you have, all of you minds who have perfected yourselves, just as I have the ability to perfect myself, I'm very, very consumed by my habits, and I'm very, very distracted by my afflictions and my senses, and I need a little bit of support so that I can train my mind. And then what does that look like? advice from them that you read and integrate and go through again and again. Yeah, so I guess the key to a lot of these is to just remember that self-awareness can make you feel defeated when in fact that very self-awareness that makes you a bit shocked at yourself is it should drive you towards refuge instead of driving you towards despair. Yeah, or driving you towards defensiveness or justifications or whatever. It's like, the more you think about refuge, the more you get inspired that all of the support you need is there. 
You know, there's the ordinary sangha of our community and our monks and nuns, but our community in general. And it could feel like a weakness to need to be around people in order to behave better and in order to structure our practice. But it's built right in as one of the refuges. It's like, take it, it's there, it's offered for your transformation. Don't feel less than because you need it. It's um, obvious that we need people. And we need people specifically who are trying to work on a spiritual path similar to ours. You know, so find them, <laughs> and you have, but, you know, find them, make friends with them, see them all the time, to the extent that you're able to, because we become like the people we surround ourselves with. And for a lot of us, our family doesn't have the same spiritual beliefs as us, and yet are very good, kind people, and are good to be around. But there's a, a level of nourishment that might be missing unless you're kind of with people on the same wavelength. And then eventually as we mature, we can kind of feel that wavelength within anyone with a path, but just it's knowing where you are, right? In the beginning, it's hard to practice with people who don't get your path. Later down the track, you can practice anywhere with anyone and see the wisdom in everything. But it's just kind of that, that thing of there's what you're aspiring to and then there's how you actually are. And that is not a problem, that is a vital self-knowing. That makes sense? Preliminaries are very important, um, uh, and I know you all know them, but um, if I skip them, then, you know, the Buddhas will strike me down like Zeus. I'm just kidding, <laughs> but we have to do it. Um, and so it's to like incite this search for and development of refuge, you know, really, really relies on remembering karma, which relies on remembering impermanence, which, you know, you go back and forth through these stages, right? So it's really clear how one links to uh, the other. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, somebody accidental mic pop okay oh yeah enough yeah um can i go back to the point when you said before that when someone is um uh, teasing you on something and you take it too seriously uh you take yourself too seriously um sometimes you do want to have a conversation about uh, something <laughs> About, about something serious and then someone is seizing you and then you feel like you're basically lonely. So yeah. how do you basically take yourself less seriously? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll how tell you when you find out, no. <laughs> we have the same problem. Um, it's, uh, you know, but uh, look, what helps is to remember the past and to remember like some recent time that I was taking myself too seriously. And then later when it wore off, how like cringy that was is like, oh my gosh, I'm, oh my gosh, what? That was nonsense. I didn't need to get all in there. Oh my gosh. So it's like, you're remembering what that headspace was like the last time you were there and remembering how absurd it felt once you kind of shook your head clear of it, you know? then the next time it arrives it still feels so important it still feels so serious but you have that that memory of the last time something felt this important it wasn't the last time i had the need to like push the conversation and to like we need to talk about it now actually was an invitation for you know conflict it doesn't mean the issue doesn't need to be talked about the issue probably does need to be talked about, but not when you're speaking from that place of, I have important feelings, <laughs> you know? When you feel like I have important feelings, then often you're triggering the other person's sense of having very important feelings, and then you have two very important feelings trying to talk to each other, and you just go, Psh. Look, I know sometimes it's inevitable, like sometimes arguments and, Sometimes even good conversations start from two very important emotions needing to discuss themselves. And it starts out kind of like uncomfortable and tense and full of emotion. And then someone is yelling or someone is crying or someone is frozen or whatever kind of blah sort of thing happens. And then you move through it and then you have a rational conversation. 
you know, those arguments that like start all kind of Whoa, and then you both kind of like come to your senses and you talk about it reasonably. Um, you know, we see this couples talking about finances. That's a classic time, right? <laughs> Two very important ideas about financial choices. And then, you know, it's all very emotional. Um, it, I, I think that it's normal and natural, and especially if you can move through the very important feeling to something that is actually calmer and more centered, I think that's great. But it almost feels like in our society that if you're not passionate about the problem or you're not heated or intense about it, it must not be important. You know, and that to convince the other person that what you're saying is important, you have to have all of this emotion with it or you don't talk about it until the emotion comes with it. And that's kind of the way we got wired, but it's not necessary, you know? And, you know, it's tricky because the other people in our lives might not play along, you know? They're not necessarily gonna agree that uh, this level of intensity and this level of affliction isn't a vital part of life. But, you know, you just kind of navigate it in a way that makes sense to you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's just, it's just coming to the realization again and again that emotions are not truth, are not wisdom. They're just information. They're just information, you know? And if, if you can sit with your past and all of the millions of ways you've responded to one simple thing. Like take something really simple and not too loaded, like, I don't know, finding a parking spot at the grocery store. There's a million ways that we've responded to not being able to find a parking spot. You know, some days we're like, oh, no parking spot. Do do do, I'll just keep driving around. Do do do, more time to think, more time to listen to the radio, more time to whatever, do do do, air conditioning, chill. Some days you're like, oh my God, I need the, you know, and you're like freaked out. You know, some days um, someone slips into the park that you found and they got in there first and you're enraged. And some days you're like amused. You're like, oh, you got it first. Well played. And you know, like there's a million responses to one simple situation that we've done so many times. And yet in the present moment, we feel like our current response is necessary, is needed, is true, is wise, must be addressed and honored. You know, it takes on all of the significance that it doesn't have from its own side. So in order to break the illusion of its significance, you just remember the past. I didn't always feel this way about this. Maybe how I'm feeling isn't about this in front of me. Maybe it's about a million other things. So let's not respond to a million other things when right now I'm talking about this small thing. Yeah, slowly, slowly, but honestly, memory of your own absurdity is just, um, <laughs> I don't know, it's the key. Memory of your own absurdity. The last time I took myself this seriously, it did not end well. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, just be gentle with it, because I, I know that a lot of us, it took a long time to even acknowledge our emotions and to even uh, see where they came from or to even speak up when we feel something is wrong and to like find our voice and to find our assertiveness, maybe not as much for Israelis, but generally speaking in life, it takes a while, you know, sometimes to even know what it is you're feeling and to be able to even articulate that to the people we love, that's a big deal to be able to do that. And then it sounds like Buddhism is saying, no, don't do that. And that's not what we're saying. We're saying there's another way of moving through that process. And the fact that we got to even know what we're feeling is a huge deal. But don't stop there. You know, just like keep going to the next level of wisdom and the next level of wisdom. Yeah. So we'll just finish up with the preliminaries and then have a break. And then we'll get into like the meat of it. So, um... The last bit is um, you're reflecting on the sufferings of samsara in general in order to develop determination to be free from the whole mess, right? So this is really renunciation or the determination to be free. So the initial scope and the small scope are vital for having real bodhicitta. Um, sometimes we wanna skip the step of seeing suffering 
um, and just go straight to the heart centered and to the sweet and to the altruistic. Um, but, you know, you really need to understand that the causes of suffering are karma and disturbing emotions, which means your mental habits, doesn't it? The causes of your suffering are your own mental habits, which are not your fault, but are still your responsibility. And then when you sit with that, you want to stop it, <laughs> right? That's renunciation. Yeah. So, you know, make it simple, but make it very direct and let it touch you. And then when you don't want to suffer this way, hopefully, naturally, that leads to, oh, this is what everyone does. This is what everyone's been doing the whole time. This is why people are crazy. This is why people are angry and sad, is that they are... Oh. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, when, when you're realizing this is the case for everyone else, you know, it softens you towards their plight and it makes you less, I guess, aggressive about them behaving badly because you see yourself in them. Yeah, even if you don't behave the same way, if you have really deep self-awareness, you can see the sameness of your afflictions, even if you have totally different responses to your afflictions. Yeah, so it could be that um, when you're feeling disconnected from the people around you and alienated and a little bit superstitious, and a little bit paranoid, you know, especially, you know, during the coronavirus when you're not sure, like, who is in your pod and who you're going to be, you know, in your daily life and you kind of get this, like, uh, when you understand that about yourself really deeply and you understand what is rational and what is irrational, then when other people are weird about the same issue, you're just like, yeah, I get it. I don't agree with your response or totally get why you're responding that way, but I get the affliction underneath, which means I get the suffering underneath, and then I get our sameness, and I give you a break. And I'm no longer sort of rattled by your affliction. I'm actually touched by your affliction because I know the suffering underneath it. Right? So you have to have this self-knowing that really goes how am I absurd? When am I absurd? Um, and then you see the absurdity in others with more kindness. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we're just gonna have like 20 minute break. Is that enough time? And then we're going to get into like the meat of the text. Um, but if you want to read ahead, um, please do just to get oriented. Um, if you didn't get the handout in your email, it's just in the chat section. You can download it from there. And, um, and we can do questions and ideas. So, um, so before we take a break, is there anything you want to make sure that we cover? Or um, anything that is unclear? Yeah, Ari. Yes, I wanted to ask about uh, compassion. I was not reminded. It belongs to the third, uh, to the great scope, that's why. Um, it belongs everywhere, but um, the, the first two scopes kind of lead you there with um, great compassion, taking personal responsibility. Yeah, so when we're doing the LOMRIM framework, it, it breaks things into kind of um, like finite chunks as if they're unrelated to each other. But of course, everything is related to everything. Yeah, so definitely compassion goes throughout, um, but it's talked about more in depth um, with the great scope. Yeah, even though it exists in the other scopes. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? 